event. Um, fortunately, we created this new event. So welcome again. My name is Tucker Johnson, and we are experiencing Nimsy Live, where we talk about the latest and greatest in translation, localization, internationalization, culturalization, and all that fun stuff global companies need to delight their international customers. On this program, we invite guests who like to have fun and have some value to add for our audience of globalization professionals. I'm always eager to provide a platform to those with a good story or a good data set. So let us know if there are any topics you'd like covered or guests we should reach out to for future episodes. And once again, a reminder, if you haven't already done so, make sure you're subscribing to Nimsy Insights on your platform of choice. We are coming to you live in theory. We are coming to you live today on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and probably a few other platforms out there as well. Uh, without further ado, because this is the second time we've started this live stream, the first one got interrupted, I'm just going to jump right into it and introduce today's topic. So in today's episode, I am talking to my colleague, Yanni Golikovsky, who is the mastermind behind the recent issue that I can try to pull up here, the recent article uh, report in Nimsy Insights called the language quality uh the lqm spectrum and if you are not familiar with nimsy insights you can go to nimsy.com and go to our research tab here and you can find it right down here the nimsy lqm spectrum the prism of quality excellence so if you are a nimsy partner you can go access this and read the full report but in today's episode we are going to dive right into this and give you an overview of what you can expect the LQM spectrum encompasses seven essential components that form the foundation of localization quality management or LQM. From quality models to user experience, each component plays a vital role in achieving language excellence. Today, we are going to explore how quality models have evolved to meet industry standards and user expectations, the importance of fostering strong vendor partnerships and harmonizing engagement across the supply chain. Additionally, we're going to uncover the rising significance of user experience and power um, and the power of incorporating end user feedback for continuous improvement, integrating innovative hybrid tech solutions, harnessing metrics for data div driven decisions and aligning quality with financial sustain sustainability are also key aspects of the spectrum. Together, these components create a unified vision of the LQM, transforming global business strategies and ensuring top notch language quality for a diverse and engaged audience. My guest today, as I've already mentioned, is Yanni Golikovsky, my colleague. With a BA degree in English language from the National University of Cordoba, Argentina, Yanni has more than 12 years of experience in the language industry. Her diverse background shaped her into a true localization expert with vast project management, data analysis, and solution designing experience. She also has considerable experience in the learning field as an instructor of project management training courses in Latin America. She has also contributed to a variety of projects here at NIMSI Insights, including user experience studies, which she's done quite a bit of. And Yanni, introduce yourself again. What, what, what again. did I miss out here? <laughs> so hello again, everyone. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. So thanks for having me, uh, Tucker. Um, I'm not sure what I can add to what you already uh, said. Uh, it's just a pleasure to dive into the LQM spectrum here and see if we can add some value in this interesting topic. Well, I'm looking forward to talking to you today. Um, I, before we get in, though, this is where I was before we got cut off. Before we get into it too much, I want to give you a chance. You're doing some interesting work in providing training and professional development in Latin America, which I wanted to plug today because I think it's such a cool initiative because so much of the training and development that we see, even in the translation industry, is very English-centric, and you're doing all of this in Spanish. Tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing. Um, yeah, it's mainly the, the reason I decided to focus on uh, the Spanish-speaking audiences, precisely because I think, as you mentioned before, it's like too English-centric. I mean, everything that is available, and I try uh, to add value mainly to um, as a Spanish speaker, you know, I live in Argentina um, and I see that the, you know, the atmosphere and the engagement you create uh, by having workshops in, in the native lang language is completely different. So uh, I try to enhance that. 
So uh, I, I think about uh, considering that instead of an obstacle as an opportunity. So I decided to focus mainly on the uh, Spanish speaking audience. Oh, very cool. And, you know, guys, if you're out there and we get cut off again, then we're just going to keep powering through this and we will post the recording afterwards. FYI. So I apologize if the stream's not working today. Sometimes they just they just don't work. So, Yanni, so um, welcome to all of our asynchronous podcast listeners and YouTube viewers where we archive everything on our, our, our platform and also on our website. So, Yanni, let's get into it. Um, what is the language, the LQM spectrum? Um, I've, been, I've talked to you about this before. I remember when you were writing it, we... We had some chats about it, um, about the different, the seven different components of it. Why, why write this? Is um, what needs is this addressing in our industry? And what is it? Give us an intro. Okay, I'll try to. So mainly the idea behind creating this LQM spectrum uh, is uh, trying to have like a baseline towards quality which it can be so abstract as a topic and so challenging sometimes because there are so many different environments out there mainly from the you know from uh the buyer side from companies from even from lsps uh, vendors so it's like the, there's always a, a challenge behind quality um so the idea was to try to create this unified vision or at least have a baseline about, you know, what to talk about when we talk about quality. So this so, is the idea of having this like colorful spectrum of the seven components, which I think they are all interrelated somehow. So whenever you think about quality, it's probably that you uh, end up talking about all these seven components, or at least the idea is to consider them uh, to, to create a, at least uh, to try to create a successful uh, quality management program. Yeah, and I like that we call it a spectrum, right? Because as you mentioned, there's so many different steps in quality. And here we have quality models, vendor management, supply chain, user experience, metrics, technology, and finance. And they're all interrelated. There's no hard cutoff points between these. And so it truly is a spectrum. And what I'd like to do today is just go through each of these, and you prepared some very nice slides for us, and maybe you can just walk us through each of these steps, starting with quality models here. Step number, I shouldn't even call it steps, but component, component okay. number one, quality models. Yeah. yeah, so quality models can be conceived as the framework uh, behind a, any quality uh, program. So, yeah, I, I think it could be like, conceived as a framework. Uh, so you see that there are so many different quality models out there. Um, there has been a tendency to focus mainly uh, nowadays, mainly on pre-production. So there have been an, an evolution in quality models, uh, depending on the different scenarios or the different, you know, industry trends too. So um, there are many quality models and the thing is that perhaps you don't need to um, resort to one specific model but perhaps uh, having different quality models applied to different scenarios according to the different uh, projects challenges uh, you are facing so perhaps it's uh, the, the wise thing to do but for that you need to be aware of the different quality models that you can resort to in case you you need to to do that. Yeah, there's so, different there's different ones out there, right? And the thing about our industry, it's very hard to have standardized approaches to anything, really, because every localization program's so different. So, mm -hmm. and it's that's not changing. That's getting worse, <laughs> if anything, right? So, okay. it's very yeah, hard so, to standardize things. Yeah. So, uh, first thing to consider is that uh, you know, industry itself is so dynamic, so it's ever changing and uh, the, the different requirements sometimes uh, are, are also uh, evolving um, day to day. So the idea is to uh, be part of that of that dynamic process. Uh, so to to be perhaps to focus on one quality model 
perhaps you're missing other things out there. So the idea is to, to consider this idea of also how quality models interact with all the different components out, out there. So yeah, it's like there are no, uh, I mean, uh, it's like the rainbow. I, I like to use that analogy in the sense that uh, you have like blurred lines between these seven components yeah, in the sense yeah, that they are so interrelated that, yeah. Well, and I, I see on the this slide here, you have XLQA as a holistic quality model. Tell us a little bit, what 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 do we mean by XLQA? XLQA, you know better than me. Oh, yeah, about but I'm that. the host. I get, to ask, I get to ask the questions here. Yeah. Well, the reason I, I, I decided to, um, to include this here is because that article that you wrote, it was, I remember, um, very, very good, and, and it was a precise moment. And it was like those aha moments for me because I was part of, uh, you know, uh, of the development of a quality program at that time. And um, for, for me, it was like uh, finally someone is saying like what I cannot put into words, perhaps of this idea of, um, you know, considering quality mainly as an experience. So there's this tendency towards moving mainly from a linguistic quality model towards a more, you know, one based more on experience. And this comes along with the idea of having, you know, the user more on the on the scene. Uh, uh, so I think it has to do with that. So that's what I think it can be considered nowadays like a holistic model. Yeah, So I, I, I like that definition. And that's why I asked you, because I like your definition better than my definition. Like <laughs> how I would say it is essentially XLQA, and it's a term that honestly I made up, um, but and I'm pleased as punch to see people actually using it in the industry now. But it's this experiential language quality um, assessment is essentially a way to incorporate elements of user experience into the localization workflow because – UX teams and localization teams need to be working closer together, in my opinion. And the more conversation that we can have that promote that, the better. Yeah. Um, quality models, reality check. And here's what I'm going to do, guys, for you out there. Um, LinkedIn's not playing nice today as far as the live stream, but we are live on YouTube and other platforms. So what we're going to do is post a link to this afterwards so that every, anybody can watch it, listen to it, and all of that stuff. And I'll also post the deck. Is that okay if I post this deck publicly? Sure. Yanni? All sure. right. Because there's a lot of really good information in this deck, and we're just not going to have time to go through every every bullet point in here. Um, no, no, yeah. And, and the idea behind having this reality check is, you know, for everyone to have time to, you know, to dig deeper into each of these components. Yeah. And I think that the best way to do that is perhaps to ask ourselves some of these questions. Yes. So to have a better idea of where we are standing uh, regarding quality. So, yeah, that's the idea. Agree. I like this. And I'm just going to read it out loud for our podcast, for the benefit of our podcast listeners um, out there. So quality models, reality check. Some questions we need to ask ourselves. Are the selected quality models aligned with the company's specific language quality objectives? Do the selected quality models cover all the necessary phases of the localization process? Are the selected quality models applicable and adaptable to the company's unique requirements? Do the selected quality models provide actionable guidelines and best practices? Are the selected quality models supported by industry standards and recognized best practices? Do translators have access to in-context previews during translation? And what QA checks are we using to test for internationalization issues? All good questions to ask yourself um, as you're designing or redesigning your language quality model. But let's move on into point two before I get completely stuck in talking about XLQA. Vendor management. So going back to our topic here, remember we have seven seven different components here, quality models, vendor management, supply chain, user experience, metrics, technology, and finance, all part of the language quality, language quality management uh, spectrum here. Moving on to point number two, vendor management. Talk to us. Okay, so uh, pretty much what it says there is that we have a diverse range of vendor options mm -hmm. uh, to select from mainly uh, from uh, in-house uh, versus outsourced uh, LQA. So the idea is to see how it relates to the quality model that you have in place. 
Um, and also I like this idea of conceiving uh, vendor management uh, as a partnership, you know, so yeah. in the sense that, yeah. So it's not just, you know, someone providing services, quality services, but you can find a true partnership sometimes in uh, your vendor uh, managers in, in the sense, I mean, in the, in the sense that they know better sometimes how to uh, deal with some quality um, issues, or they uh, sometimes have really interesting ideas on how to uh, tweak some processes or to enhance or optimize some uh, workflow uh, processes. So I think it's interesting uh, to consider uh, yeah, this idea of partnership when uh, thinking about vendor management as a component in this. AQM spectrum. And just like with defining a quality model, like there's no one set vendor strategy out there. It's very customized for for each individual localization program out there. Um, reality check. Walk us through walk us through the points here for the, the per, for the benefit of our, our listeners who can't see the screen oh. right now. Okay, so uh, really to check for vendor management, does the vendor have a proven track record of delivering high quality language services? Does the vendor have a robust quality management system in place? Does the vendor have a pool of qualified and experienced linguists? Does uh, the vendor have a collaborative and communicative approach? Does the vendor provide transparency and accountability in their quality assurance processes? Of course, there are many much more questions, but this is just uh, like a conversation starter uh, for everyone so yep and I mean I love conversation starters because you need to be having <laughs> conversations with your supply chain right it's not just if you are just sending orders and receiving deliverables from your vendors then you're not maximizing that partnership as you said and yeah. I don't even like this term vendors right I mean they are vendors we are vendors but <laughs> the most mature um, and forward-thinking localization programs out there are the ones that fully partner with their vendors to your point earlier yeah which takes us into the supply chain which you've already started yes. talking about uh yeah so as we can see it's it all comes to this workflow and supply chain how this uh, vendor engagement um is uh indeed you know comes into the scene uh, so it has to do with the quality model, the vendor uh, management, and how it um, it has place in this uh, quality, uh, sorry, in the supply chain or, or workflow. Um, so there are some aspects that you may want to consider to create this idea of a solid or robust quality supply chain. So um, basically, the idea is um, to consider having a, a true engagement of capable and reliable partners. And again, partnership is a, um, a key word here. Uh, flexibility to adapt to changing requirements, continuous improvement with regular feedback loops in the sense that, of course, it's dynamic and requirements sometimes change. So um, establishing clear communication channels to uh, an agile deployment of content updates, and of course, combination of human and automated elements that we will see later in uh, the technology component too. Yeah, I mean, as with so much, like we talk about technology a lot in this industry, and there are many good uses of it. There's many, I would say, overuses of it. And that's kind of the ongoing negotiation that we have in our industry, which is, you know, we're a people centric industry. We're all about connecting people. We translate mm -hmm. words and help people connect across language, uh, across cultures and all that stuff. But we need to also be taking advantage of the latest technology trends and like the ongoing negotiation, whether it's about supply chain, we're going to get to technology here soon. But the ongoing negotiation is always this, you know, where, where do you draw that line between, um, you know, mm -hmm. and that's super important when you're putting together your supply chain because you need to know what, what type of supply chain you're putting together and what type of technology enablement you're going to have there. So walk us through our, our reality check, check. So supply chain reality check is a supply chain robust and reliable. So are there effective communication channels with suppliers? Is there a mechanism to monitor and evaluate supplier performance? Does the supply chain support continuous improvement initiatives? 
Are we running automated quality checks before or after this, the translation stage? Are the mechanisms for feedback and collaboration between stakeholders to address any issues or challenges that may arise during the supply chain process? Is there a system in place to monitor and track the progress of content localization throughout the supply chain? Allowing and for real time visibility and timely intervention? Are contingency plans and alternative vendor options in place to mitigate risks and ensure continuity in unforeseen circumstances? And this is a really important uh, point here too. That sometimes we tend to rely too much on one specific, you know, yeah. part of that supply chain, and we don't think about, you know, <laughs> having yes, any kind of. Yeah, I know the the point of the the spectrum is, is to provide a framework to discuss and have these conversations as we were just talking about. It's not necessarily to make recommendations and tell people how they should be doing anything. But to your point, how do you feel about single sourcing vendors versus having multiple vendors? Like, where do you draw the line there? Because I remember, you know, Back in the day, I remember there was this big push towards single sourcing, having one vendor to do everything. And I think some companies kind of got burned out there because it, it creates risk there. And they mm -hmm. didn't have those alternative vendor options out there. So what would you say about that? Um, it's like we were saying before, it's like there's no one size fits all approach. Uh, for any of these components. So I think that the um, idea behind this is like um, taking the time to analyze all the seven components carefully and see what works best for you and your partner, uh, right. whoever is your partner, right? So, uh, and this is the idea. This is why I wanted to create like this framework. So um, to, to make sure that you're tackling or addressing all these components since they are so interconnected and so interrelated that uh, you are making sure to to have this solid and robust uh, quality program. And, and, and that so you're creating are, something yeah. that works for you, right? You're not just creating something. Where I've seen localization programs, um, quality programs and just localization programs in general, where I've seen them fail like big time is mm -hmm. when you're trying to recreate something you're trying to copy another organization. You're trying to copy another company. Like you used to work at, and I'm making this up. I am not thinking of anyone specifically out there. Um, but it's like you used to work at Microsoft and then you go to Facebook and you're like, well, here's how we did it at Microsoft. So here's how we're going to do it at Facebook. And you start making all of these changes. And the reality is like what might, what works at Microsoft might not work at Facebook. You might have to come up with something new. And that's why I love these, you know, these reality check points in here, because I think if you download this deck and I'll post it, like I said, on Nimsy's LinkedIn page as a downloadable PDF, um, if you download this deck and you ask yourself and your team these questions and you just go through here really quickly and it, it kind of tells you like, here's where you need to be going before you start mm -hmm. designing a quality program. And then you might, you know, you might not be able to answer all these questions. You might need to pull in your supply chain, pull in your vendors to it, or, you know, shameless plug for Nimsy. We help people create, you know, define their localization program roadmaps all of the time, including language quality programs. So you might want to bring in an external consultant. So you might want to talk to your vendors. There's all sorts of different associations. You might want to leverage your professional network, all sorts of different options out there. But uh, if you allow me, I think that there's a, uh, um a question and I remember that you mentioned this uh, in, in another live session I cannot remember who was the uh, the guest but uh, the question of what's good enough when talking about quality I think right. that's a, a, a you know it's their question to answer so and that allows you to make sure that you are you know adjusting all these different possibilities and components to um you know to answering that question so what's good enough according to that specific project that specific product to that specific service so and for that and here is when it comes you know the the user experience in the sense that who can help you answer that question well the user 
Uh, nice so segue I'm, into the next component here, <laughs> Yanni. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, because I, I, I can see in my mind, I hopefully you can also see that too. See how it's going, uh, yeah. the thought process so, here. Yeah. So uh, what's good enough? Well, ask, you know, your the, the consumer, your uh, client, your, uh, you know, uh, so that's the idea. Um, because uh, I think it also has to do, and again, it, it uh, leads me to the first component to this, um, considering uh, ex, uh, the experiential quality model as a holistic model, right? So there, there's a, an undeniable tendency uh, towards that, I think. So we're talking about, and for those following along at home, uh, we're talking about user experience, uh, the next component here and how to optimize the UX. You say involving the target audience in the testing process. How do you do that? What are some, what are some of the ways that you've seen organizations involve the audience in the testing process? Because it's going to look different for every program. It's going to look different for every, because every, every company has different customers. And, you know, if you're B2B, business to business organization, that is going to look very different from if you're B2C, business to consumer. So just at a high level, what are some of the ways, what are some of the things people can start doing today to include their target audience into the localization testing process? I think that the main one we can consider is, you know, um, consumer satisfaction. Um, perhaps the easiest way to do that is uh, through surveys. Uh, you can also have uh, internal surveys, even for your, even if you are an LSP and want to, you know, for even I, I'm thinking out loud here, but uh, QBRs sometimes are a way of, yeah. you know, yeah. I, I think that it's a way of uh, measure, you know, that um, satisfaction out there. So, um, and I think that that's uh, a way to do that. Uh, and of course, again, it depends on the product you have in place or the different uh, challenges, but at least to consider uh, listening the voice of the consumer of users, I think it's a good starting point. Yeah, and so, you, yeah. Can, you can get as fancy, this is what I tell people, it's like you can spend as much money as you want on this. And you know, if you have money that you wanna spend on this, give us a call because mm -hmm. we, we do a lot of this work here at NMZ, as you well know, Yanni, you're, you're leading <laughs> yes. a lot of that work. And like I you want to convene, you know, 10 person in person in country focus groups where you sit, you know, have a, a UX researcher sit with them for four hours and talk about it. you can do that. Is it going to cost you a lot of money? Yes, it is. Right. So, I mean, but there's a great there's a middle area in that you I'll don't have it. to go all the way to that. Mm -hmm. you, there's some very practical things that you can start doing today usually at very little investment, either with budget or time, there's some things that you can start doing today to start including the voice of your customer in there. And yeah, exactly. we don't need to get into that too much today. Um, no, no, but, but I mean, um, just to prove your point, yes, we, we even conducted many studies, UX studies, uh, which are perhaps, it, it sounds like simple, like uh, creating a survey, but the thing is, what we do with those results and that's the the most interesting thing to do is how we analyze that information how we uh, can create insights about that uh so it's not just about what the um customers say yeah. but how to interpret that information and, and that's where i would say um i mean perhaps a self-serving statement but i would say be cautious of relying upon your existing supply chain to do this type of work, your tr more traditional LSPs, because those traditional LSPs are, they're going to be hyper-focused as, as they perhaps should be hyper-focused on traditional, traditional LSPs are going to be focused on traditional language quality metrics. And the whole point of trying to incorporate the user experience into the localization quality, um, processes and ideas out there is to start thinking outside the box and really start shifting the way that we're doing things. So 
be careful about just relying upon your existing supply chains, I would say, for UX research out there. Likewise, be, be careful about relying upon traditional user experience companies to measure multicultural, multilingual user experience if you're looking for metrics that are specifically speaking to the quality of the localization. So that's that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, user experience reality check. I'll give you a break, Yanni, and I'll, I'll read through this one. So does the company deeply understand the target audience's expectations and preferences? And I'll add to that, those expectations and preferences are different for every market. Um, they can be very different. Um, next, are user experience considerations integrated into the localization process from the outset? Is the localization localized content tested and validated for user experience? Are localization efforts tailored to the cultural and linguistic expectations of the target audience? That's the big one. That That's one that a lot of traditional UX um, shops, agencies, perhaps don't understand. Um, and lastly, does the company actively seek and act upon user feedback to improve the user experience? Right. So that's your reality check, which takes us into the next section here, metrics. Yeah, how are metrics. We, how are we doing here? So we've got just a quick recap. We're going through the seven components of the NIMSI LQM spectrum. We've talked about quality models, vendor management, supply chain, user experience, and now we're in the home stretch. We're going to talk about metrics, technology, and finance. So how do metrics, um, how are they involved in a language quality program? I would say. Yes, we, we talk about data, uh, collecting data, for instance, through UX studies. Uh, and of course, the idea behind uh, collecting that data is to have, uh, you know, like a, a, a solid uh, visualization of where you're standing. Um, the idea is that you can perhaps uh, want to have some, um, uh, you may want to evaluate uh, or, or have you make some progress uh, in if you implement some changes in your program. Uh, so the idea is if you are collecting uh, information, data, metrics, uh, make sure that you're using uh, those metrics. Uh, otherwise, you're just collecting data. And if you are not doing anything with that uh, information, yeah. then it's, you know, it's just like a waste of time. <laughs> And we know that wasting time is like wasting money. Yeah, so. it, it was pretty. It's pretty much common sense, but it still needs to be saying. I think I was last week. I was giving a workshop on on quality. I was giving a workshop on quality program components. I think, and I was talking about metrics. And like what I say all the time is, do not do not use what I call vanity metrics, which is like mm -hmm. I want to have twenty different reports in my dashboard because it makes me feel smart. Only track and only report data that's going to help you or your clients or your customers make better business decisions. That's that's my one benchmark is tracking this, reporting it and analyzing it, you know, once a month, once a quarter, whatever. Is it going to help me make better business decisions? And if the answer is no, then don't track it. Yeah. I would say. Absolutely. Yes. That's the idea behind, you know, having metrics is uh, to make better informed decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, after all, so yeah, it's all about that. So, do you want me to read? Yeah, you, you take okay. a turn here. So, I, met metrics reality check from Yanni, everybody. Go for it. Okay. Are the metrics comprehensive enough to capture all relevant aspects of language quality? Are the metrics aligned with the company's language quality objectives? Are the metrics reliable and consistent in measuring language quality? Do the metrics provide actionable insights for improving language quality? Are the metrics regularly reviewed and updated to reflect evolving quality requirements? And I think this is really important. So yeah. I think I, I included something uh, about, you know, it's like having a, a compass uh, so you can, uh, you know, in your localization or in your uh, quality management journey you have like metrics mm -hmm. which can uh, guide you where uh, you want to go but from time to time perhaps you need to look around and make sure that you are using that compass 
yeah. uh, efficiently, you know? You see a <laughs> yeah. lot of these like legacy metrics, legacy processes um, even where it's like a company's tracking and reporting something. Why? Because that's the way it's always been done, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's you, what I mean. you could so. <laughs> make an argument that like traditional LQA metrics – now I'm going to be careful what I say about LQA because I'm not anti LQA. People think I'm anti language quality assurance, like traditional scorecard based um, LQA models. I'm not. I just think that in 2023 and beyond, they're not sufficient by themselves. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, which leads us into, you know, what we're talking about here essentially, <laughs> but let's move on to the technology, technology. thoughtful integration <laughs> of technology and human involvement. Yeah, basically, it's about that. You know, it's like um, finding the balance between, yep. you know, automation, yep. technology, and human reviewers in the sense that, of course, there are pros and cons. Uh, so, again, you uh, may want to find what's the balance for you specifically, because uh, we can talk a lot about ideal scenarios. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, but it all comes down to what you have available regarding technology about, you know, uh, also um, from uh, the, the human side of things, too. So uh, I think we, we have to be careful about that, too, because uh, sometimes you don't have the possibility to integrate or uh, you know, use um, connectors between different, uh, you know, technologies. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it affects the workflow and the supply chain. So you have to redesign everything according to uh, your, you know, current availabilities regarding technology or all the other components too. So, and this leads us to finance too because sometimes it all comes to budget <laughs> well right and i'm gonna have I'm just debating whether to pipe in here or wait for finance but like with technology yeah. technology should never be the goal in in and yeah. of itself and i've talked to these people on the client side um where it's like i want more technology i want i want ai okay mm-hmm. I, I, the, this is an honest conversation I've had with people. It's like, I want artificial intelligence in my localization program. And, like, with due respect, that's a stupid thing to ask for, right? Because it doesn't have a problem statement. What problem are you trying to solve with technology? And that's where we need to go. What unique challenges does your program face that can be helped or solved by technology. It, it shouldn't be the cart pushing the horse or cart, the cart before the horse, right? You, you need to start with those challenges and then analyze how can technology help me with that, which... Absolutely. And, and um, I'm also thinking that uh, I think I, I wrote something about that in, in the article that sometimes technology can be, of course, an enabler, but sometimes... Yeah, it functions more as an obstacle sometimes because it makes um, difficult processes even more difficult sometimes because you have to, you know, include uh, technology or, you know, incorporating some, uh, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, uploading information in different uh, platforms or whatever. So I I think it also has to do with that. So, yeah. Uh, again, it's like finding the, the balance and thinking again what's good enough. And yeah. I, I found it here in your article so, um, under part six, of course, is technology is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it can be perceived as an enabler helping to optimize tasks and processes and simultaneously as a blocker when it has to be used as a part of specific workflows turning already time-consuming tasks into more cumbersome processes. Here, here, I I couldn't agree more with that. So let's, all right, reality check. I'll do, the, I'll yeah. do the reality check. Technology oh. reality check. Are we training our machine translation engines? A lot of people aren't still. Um, 
Well, I mean, I, I, I shouldn't say that so snarky. You know, if you don't have a ton of data to train them with, maybe the cost benefit doesn't work out, which we're going to talk about in the finance in the next section. Are we experimenting with large language models and AI? Um, yeah, and now is the point where here in July of 2023, mm -hmm. I would say hold your horses and don't implement any of this new crazy AI stuff yet don't hard code it into your program yet but absolutely be experimenting with it and if you don't have the time for experimenting with it work with vendors who are right because a lot of that innovation is going to come from the supply chain uh are we training the ai we are using are we utilizing the qa tools available in our tms are we taking advantage of standalone qa tools available on the market so don't just limit yourself to the qa tools that your tms has to offer there are lots of third-party standalone qa tools um check out the nimsy technology atlas we catalog all of that stuff you can find something that works for your needs do we have a query automation system are we also taking advantage of technology to streamline multimedia qa uh, how are we selecting machine translation engines? All good questions, um, which leads us into finance. And I love that finance comes after technology, and I love that it comes last because all of this stuff, when de de defining a language program, a quality program, when defining any program, tech finance is always going to be the constraint. There's always going to be a cost-benefit for anything that you implement, and the goal is not to have as much, as good of quality as humanly possible. The goal is to find that sweet spot where you're at the point where you're investing just the right enough or just the right amount to get the quality that you need and not crossing that point where you're starting to see diminishing returns, at which point additional investment's not going to be, be possible. But I'll shut up and let, let you walk us through the finance section here, Yanni. Um, okay. I'm not much uh, to, to add here, just um, there are, of course, uh, efficiency and cost savings. These are, are like internal things to consider. Uh, and we have like the idea of customer satisfaction, which is also related to what has been discussing before on brand reputation, which, of course, uh, are also um, benefits of a well-designed uh, quality program. Uh, mainly from a financial perspective, as we are uh, seeing here. But um, yeah, the idea is um, to, and again, it comes to the scene, this idea of um, the, the user experience, which can be uh, really beneficial when uh, thinking about quality uh, and relating that to the financial perspective. Well, I, I would say user experience is the only thing that should be <laughs> cared about when talking about quality. And this is why people think I'm against LQA scorecards, because yeah. I say, who cares what the LQA scorecard says? Is the user having a good experience or not, right? Now, there is a correlation there. Like if the LQA scorecard, you know, if you're getting high LQA scores, the likelihood that your users are having a good experience is much higher, but not necessarily yeah. a one-to-one -one correlation. Like you can have- Absolutely perfect quality and the users are still having a bad experience because of cultural differences because of whatever right and there are many cultural dimensions from the ux perspective that you can consider about that and there are i mean different markets uh, care uh, more or less about linguistic things perhaps right. uh, they, you know um care more about other components so yeah the, again is there's uh, there's this shift from linguistic to uh, experience, experience. Uh, which I think, is, yeah, yeah, I think it's really relevant here. And again, this is just, um, um, you know, another uh, journey towards uh, that. Uh, so from the customer satisfaction perspective and how is uh, important to this financial success. Yeah, and I like this. This is what a lot of CFOs don't understand, um, particularly mm -hmm. about localized content. Um, it says here, customer satisfaction is crucial to financial success. Foster positive customer interactions by delivering high quality localized content that meets the linguistic and cultural expectations of the target audience. This leads to language quality directly impacting customer experiences. Satisfied customers are more likely to engage with the content, trust the brand, and become loyal advocates. 
and this customer satisfaction can translate into increased sales, repeat business, and positive word of mouth referrals, which is going to lead to financial growth. And so many localization program managers, this is the the bane of their existence is trying to get to their C-suite or their CFO in particularly to understand that localization is a, a revenue driver, not just a cost driver. Yes, indeed, absolutely. So I'll go with this uh, final reality check on finance, uh, if you want me to Please. read that. Okay, uh, so how do I make sure I'm maximizing the budget? What is the allocated budget for language quality management activities? Is there a cost-efficient vendor management strategy in place? Are there opportunities to leverage technology for cost savings in LQM? Is there a monitoring and reporting mechanism to track financial performance in LQM? Are the cost of LQM activities aligned with the expected return or on investment or ROI? So yeah, uh, many more questions. And which a lot of these require, and this is why everything blends together. Like in order to be tracking this stuff, you need the data, you need the metrics, which takes us back uh, to point number four, I believe. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, so they are all interrelated. Yeah. yeah. So create a unified vision. So, so please. Yeah, we we have uh, have this colorful conversation about the seven components, but uh, the idea behind this was creating this unified vision. And again, uh, you know, there again, there's no one size uh, fits all approach. So the idea is that you can establish well-defined objectives, answering what is good enough or uh, what quality entails in your specific context at the company product and service levels might be a good start. Acknowledging LQM as a dynamic process, it's also relevant. It needs to be revisited periodically to make sure it meets the previously established objectives. And again, this idea of strategic design to see which, if any, or uh, the seven components uh, has a predominant influence over the others. Yeah. And it, it should be prioritized. Yeah, because not yeah. depending upon your organizational culture, there's this is going back to what we originally started this conversation with. Every program is going to look different, and it depends upon the organizational culture. So, any any final thoughts or takeaways that we can we leave with today, Yanni? Uh, no, I, I was thinking that, that um, what my main goal with this uh, article was like trying to have like uh, a common language when talking about lang uh, quality, sorry. So uh, at least that whenever we, we consider quality, uh, make sure that we are uh, considering all these seven components. And uh, of course, no, uh, the, the idea is uh, trying to have this unified vision considering uh, all these um different variables that we need to consider and um, i mean it, it, and again it's a, a challenging uh, topic quality it has always been but I, I just try to throw some you know ideas uh towards this well thank you so much for coming on we're, we're wrapping it up right at the end of the hour here so i think no. even with our technical difficulties we were able to get through pretty much everything today so we're going to take this and archive this on our youtube channel and i'm also going to see if we can maybe get this video embedded directly into the language quality the lqm spectrum article that we have once again for you guys out there that are listening if you are a nimsy partner you can check out the full report at nimsy.com along with a lot of other great research and um, if you have any questions about that you can reach out to yanni directly either on linkedin or contact us at info at nimsy.com so with that i will start taking us out here ladies gentlemen and chat we are out of time for today. If you enjoy this NIMSY Live experience, then you can join me next time in a few minutes when we're going to try it again with a, a different guest. We're going to be talking about language technology. So if that's something that's interesting to you, then join us in about 20 minutes when we'll be live again. 
I appreciate my guest today, Yanni Golikovsky. I appreciate all my colleagues here at MZ Insights doing the hard work so I can have these fun conversations. I appreciate everybody in our industry who fills out MZ surveys and schedules briefings with our analysts so we can include you in our published industry research. And finally, I appreciate you, the audience, who are joining us live today. I appreciate the dialogue and chat and everybody who leaves comments, questions, and especially criticisms. And I look forward to next time. Cheers. Cheers.